Wow, here we are, folks. Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. And never do I ever take for granted to just jump on here and start something. I've had to do some research. I've had to do some praying. I've had to do some seeking the face of the Lord. I, when I die, and I'm in heaven, and somebody puts one of these on, if I've incorrectly said something or done something, it's more than likely going to show up, and it may show up in the heavenlies. So I need to be careful of what I do. There's a prayer book out there that's from the Institute of Ministers, offices of the Institute of Ministers. Somebody started something, wrote their name on it, and wrote a prayer book. Whether they got the prayers from ministers or not is, is not known. But anyway, it has a book with prayers in it. And this is a prayer called the Preacher's Prayer. It's, Oh my God. And when you say, Oh my God, it better be that you're speaking to the God that is your God, the God of heaven. And very few people have I ever heard start out a prayer with that. And, and I start out with a prayer, Dear Lord. It's me again. And I, I usually don't say I'm not worthy uh, that I should be a shittest come under this roof. I don't say that either. <laughs> I say, you have made me worthy to come under this roof. And I appreciate it. And I thank you for it. And I'm glad that I can come under this. By the way, this roof that I'm under is God's house. And it happens to be the one I live in and on a daily basis in another area. And so, but it is God's house. If God helped me build it, God had me build it. And he had me build it and get it paid for. So that I can use what money I have in his work. To get out here and help people and building a camp we're building and doing things that we're doing in the church that I belong to. And so, and I'm a servant. And, it, and this guy that's praying here in this prayer book, he said, and thou hast honored thy servant. No. God is closer than thou to me. He is the God of heaven. And he also is the God of earth. And he's my God. And he's the God of this house. And therefore, we have to uh, understand that we don't have to use great and swelling words. Uh, he says, uh, with appointing him to stand in thy house. Well, God has appointed me to stand in his house. He has appointed me to stand in the street, in the street corner, to stand in the park and teach and preach, to go to the jailhouse and teach and preach, to go to the nursing home and visit and preach and teach, to do everything in the places that he would have me be, wherever I go and he goes with me, he is there. And he is there. And if he's there, people will know he's there. I have very uh, no problem uh, understanding that people realize when I come in that God came in too. He came in in me. And, and I'm able to expound the word of God anywhere that God is and he's everywhere so here this guy is praying here and he says be ever with me in the performance well I'm not performing I'm acting actual naturally if I'm naturally a Christian and I'm acting naturally as a Christian then I, what I do is not a performance, it's an action. And the action is, is to be a Christian. Of all the duties of the ministry. Well, I'm not a minister in a church with a group of people, so to speak. 
I am a minister of individuals and individual places, and that makes me a minister of the Word. And God is with His minister, so He has called me to be a minister. I was ordained in 1974 as a minister and been one ever since. Have I had a church with a group of people in it? No. And that's, I've just been in the Word, been a minister, been a, a teacher in Sunday school and classes and meetings, had many, many things uh, go on in my life. God has used me in ministries. I had a, a mission. I've had two or three missions and, and worked with those. I worked with soldier boys for a few years and I worked with different groups, different things. And so that's what God had quickened me to do. And my prayer is, is that He'll quicken me some more. And uh, uh, devotion is so important. I must have devotion with the Lord. And uh, in preaching, I must have readiness. I must be ready at the drop of a hat. Our Sunday school teacher had a spell last week. And I said to him, you want me to go ahead and start the class? And he said, yes, as they were taking him, putting him in the ambulance, taking him to the hospital. So I did the class instantly, on the spot, with no study, no nothing, but already got readiness in my heart. I used John 3, 16. And this is what I said. Hey, the God that created this heaven and the earth, he has this man in his hand. But the God that created, the God that spoke everything into existence, the God that made Adam and Eve, that made mankind, is in control. He's this God of John 3.16. That He so loved mankind that He sent His Son to die on the cross to give all salvation up until the point of Jesus Christ. Salvation had come to the house of Israel. And salvation came to the Gentile, which most of us in the United States of America are Gentiles. We're not Jews. There are many, many, many Jews who are Israelites in America. And they are God's chosen people. And you know what? God said He was going to bless them. He did not hang a tag on them that said, if you don't follow me, I'm not going to bless you. He said, no, you're my people, and I'm going to bless you whether you follow me or not. And he blessed them in certain ways. You say, do you think, Brother Peter, for a couple hundred years in the desert, with so many hundreds of them dying every day for 40 years, uh, after the commission of those that would go into the promised land, that God was still blessing them? Yes, he was blessing them. Those that were alive and fallen God, they were eating. They had food. God gave them manna from heaven. That was a blessing. Our problem today is we think we need to stuff ourselves three times a day <coughs> and gouge ourselves with royalty when that is not necessary. The poorest man on earth seems to be living fine with one meal a day. And if we were acclimated to that, we could live fine with one meal a day. And we wouldn't be fat and oversized and all of the stuff that we have. What he says here, if you're going to study and you're going to preach and you're going to be, you've got to have a readiness about you. <clears throat> you've got to have a readiness that has expression with it. That you can express that which you are ready to express. And you can, you can have it. And then we can ask God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, and say this, Dear Jesus, for your sake, and for the sake of those that I'm going to meet today, will you put your power on me? Will you do me with your power? Then when I speak to somebody, they'll know it's not just a man speaking to them. But God himself is in the presence. And they will know that. And when, when I leave, that they'll say, Man, I met a man. I don't know when it was, where he was, or who he was.
But I know one thing. He told me about God and I believe what He said. Because the Holy Spirit will take what you say and put it in the person. Preaching is a unique characteristic of Christianity. It's the great appointed appointment and the great way of spreading good tidings of salvation through Christ. The Christian preacher with his message of joy and hope from the beginning it's still, it's still the personal message of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? He preached a lot of times one-on-one. -on -one. He healed one-on-one. -on -one. People one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't say the whole crowd, y'all be healed. No. He, he took that specific one. He knew the heart of that one. And he knew that one was there for the reason that he could do that and they would be a gospel preacher. They would preach by the fact that they were lame, they were blind, they were maimed, and now they're not. That by itself would preach. And then when people ask them, they say, well, Jesus healed me. All right, preaching is still the most uh, persuasive agency for bringing men to the realization that they are lost and that they need to come to God and ask Him for forgiveness so they can be saved. And that this is, the Bible said, through the foolishness of preaching. The world thinks a man that preaches is foolish. <laughs> they say, you mean you get up there and tell a whole bunch of people about what God says in His Bible? Yes. The Lord said, go tell the whole world. You go make one be a servant for me and he'll go make another one be a servant for me and he'll go make another one be a servant for me and the chain will go around the earth. All the links will hook together one day and it will be one chain around the earth. Since communication is the primary objective of preaching, the areas of speech and public speaking become matters of special concern. It is not the gift of the native eloquence that makes a man outstanding as he speaks to others, other men, but rather the fact that he has taken hold of something or that something has taken hold of him. Wow. And he can't keep himself from spreading the word. <laughs> what a place to be. Can you keep yourself from spreading the word? I can't. I don't care who it is. I'm, I'm in, I'm in uh, Home Depot. Walking down the aisle and somebody speaks to me. They open the door. And they open the door, by the way. I carry these little things here. You can send away and get them to different places. This is a, called a track. It's a piece of paper that has the gospel inside of it. It just so happens God had me write this one in 1974. And I've been using it ever since and passing it out. It has the information on the back now of the church I go to now. I've been through a couple of churches and it, this up here has been different. It used to say Oakside Baptist Church originally. And down here it said uh, Peter Hutchins a jail ministry. I was a jail preacher. I preached in the jailhouse. I was the bus minister. I worked on the buses. We had seven buses when I got done and left that particular church. And we had a bus ministry. We brought hundreds of people in. And by the way, I meet them. I met one the other day. He said, hey, Peter, you remember me? I said, yeah, I remember. He's now he's about 30, 35 years old. And I remember him when he was five or six years old. He, I picked him up on my bus. And he's following the Lord now. And so, uh, it's important. So anyway, the work you do will go on. But anyway, these are right here. I pull one of these out and I always pass it to them. I say, put this in your pocket and you get a chance. Sometime I read it or whatever and it has good information on it. And then, if, if the Lord uh, has me, uh, tells me to, 
Uh, he said, by the way, would you like a hot dog? And most men will say, yeah, you know I love them things. I don't get them very often, but I love them. Uh, and then if it's a lady, I, I'll say, would you like a pack of gum? And I give her a pack of spearmint gum or, or something of that effect. And uh, of course in this pocket, I've got hot balls too. Because when I go out, I plan to go out prepared. Prepared. And I'm prepared. I have my, my bullets. <laughs> These are my bullets. And, uh, and the, the Bible's my gun. And the track is, is the, the loading mechanism right here. This is where we load up and get ready. And then we can go ahead and give the gospel. If we're prayed up, studied up, prayed up, we had to get up. I get up in the morning, many mornings, way before daylight. The Lord usually wakes me up sometime around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and uh, tells me to get up. Some mornings he says, get up and get on YouTube. Some mornings he says, get up and go down to the service station on the interstate down here. And uh, I got somebody coming in there that needs me. And I've been talking with them. They're riding down the road. They got a gun in their seat and they're thinking about suicide. And I want you to speak to him. And so I talk to him about God. And I think that the Lord's had me speak to very many people that were in that particular situation. I know he has some that I know directly about. And so God wants us to do what he wants us to do. He wants us to be obedient. First to give our life to him. And then follow what he says. You don't have to be some kind of superhero or some kind of superman to be a Christian. You just have to follow God. And okay. So effective preaching is not a secret of technique alone. Uh, it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Never forget that. I don't care how smart you are, intelligent you are, how many big words you know, how much uh, less explanation you know by using one word. Uh, that all doesn't matter. What matters is that people understand what you say. That's what matters. And the Holy Spirit guides the preacher in the passages upon which he is to preach. It's called illumination. Insight. It's called discernment. It's called providing during the preparation of the sermon. As you're studying the sermon, and you're studying the Word, and you're saying, God, you're going to put a group of people before me. I want you to have me say the words that I'm going to say. God knows the heart of every single person out there. You've got 400 people sitting out there, and here you are up here. And you want to give every single one of those 400 people the word that they can take home with them. Every one of them is going to take home a different segment. And the chances are there will be many leave there that they'll remember only one word. One word. They sat there for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes with a, with a recitation and whatever, and, and they got one word. <laughs> Some of them are sitting there, is he ever going to quit? <laughs> They're getting nothing. They think they're getting nothing, but they are getting something. God's giving them something. That's why they want him to quit, because the preaching is uh, intrusive. It intrudes into the other people's life. Preaching is intrusive. It comes in to that person. It intrudes in them. The guy said, well, man, he's talking about adultery, and I'm living with a woman I ain't married to. Well... God's telling you, you need to get married to her or you all separate. There's no such a thing in a divorce with Shaka. So you can just separate, just walk away. Ah, he guides the preacher. He gives him illustrations and materials to use that normally he wouldn't probably use. He gives the preacher memory. And, and what really is, is, is a fact that's really good, he stimulates the preacher. When the preacher steps up there and says, Dear God, I pray that you'll give me today the power to present this message that you have for the people. 
and poof, wham, the Holy Spirit comes over. You have to take a double breath and say, wait a minute, folks, I've got to get composed. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has come in here and overwhelmed me. And you preach under that auspices. You teach under that auspices. And the word will go out, not come back void. The word will go out and not be void. Which is so important. So important. So important. Alright, the Holy Spirit guides the preacher. Gives him things that are illustrative in his mind as he's preaching. Uh, there are parallel passages in the Bible. When you are putting a sermon together, you will read a passage, and in the center reference in your Bible, if you've got a good King James Version Bible, the center reference will give you a reference of, say it's got a Z there. That Z, you go over in the center reference and you find Z. If it's got a 3 there, you go over in the center reference and find 3. And it will tell you another verse that pertains to this verse. It may be in another scripture. It may even be in the Old Testament. And you can put those together. And the Holy Spirit provides the boldness and the confidence at the time of presentation. And the Holy Spirit will give you recall. And he will allow you to uh, be, put the whole thing in uniform position, whether you can do that or not. And the Spirit will convict those in the audience of the sins in their life. You don't have to go ahead and name a whole bunch of sins. You can just talk about sin in general. What is a sin to a man? That which he's convicted of. That which a man is convicted of is sin to him. It might not be a sin to another person. Smoking might not be a, a sin to some people. But to me it was. God immediately called me to be a preacher of the word. And when he did, he said, that is part of the world you can't do. Could you see a preacher getting in the pulpit and lighting a cigarette? Did you know that out of the 400 we have in our church, perhaps 200 of them would get up and walk out if the preacher lit a cigarette? They'd just get up and walk out. Because they'd say, that man's a hypocrite. He's telling us not to dabble in the world. He's telling us not to do the things of the world. And he's doing it. Who wants to listen to a man that's doing what he's telling other people not to do? See, the Spirit convicts under sin, bringing righteousness and judgment. Uh, let, um, God Himself will fix the word in you to come out of your mouth when you're preaching or teaching and to put it in the minds and the memories of the hearers. It's not that you're a great orator. If you're a great orator, you're probably not preaching anything but yourself. And how well can that man speak? Oh, he is such a great orator. He has such a handle on words, and he can do so much with those words. That's not preaching. Preaching and teaching is taking the Word of God and putting it out in a, in a very fine, just in a self way. Just be yourself. Follow it up. In cases that are productive. You got somebody in the church who perhaps went blind and was healed? who perhaps was in the hospital with cancer and you went there and prayed and God got them out of the bed and now they're cancer free. 
You can follow up with some of the general things that happen right in your own parish, in your own place, your own church, your own whatever you call it, in order to be effective in the extension of God's kingdom. That's adding to God's kingdom. The gospel must be preached in the, in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit of God, preaching is void, and without its, its tinkling brass and sounding, town, sounding cymbals. <laughs> Paul said, lest I become tinkling brass and sounding cymbals, if I try to preach without the Holy Spirit. Wow, our time has almost come and gone. The preacher's power is going to be in the presentation. It will be controlled to some extent by his devotion and his task. Whatever you put in it is what you'll get out of it, that says. His ability to sympathize with the listeners will also be a factor. That's being prayed out and saying, God, whoever it is there that needs a word, you have me say the word that they need, and God will do that. And the most important item will be his relationship to God himself. The preacher is the power of the Holy Spirit is a great key to preaching. The great key to preaching a message or being a servant of God is being in tune with God. If you're in tune with God, then you can be a servant of God. Well, our time's come and gone. We'll have a word of prayer and we're going to go. The most precious Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. For the opportunity to stand here, Lord, and, and preach this message today, I pray, God, that you take it, put it in the hearts of those listeners now that listen to it. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.